Welcome to Smyrna Christian Church, where the entire Word of God is taught straight from the Bible. Good evening. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church. Going to get into another round of questions today. Always remember, as we always say, never take my word or anyone else's word for what they say, but you have to study the word for yourself. Search out the, the second and the third witnesses where you find the word. And remember, the Bible always proves itself. So you need to seek it out, and that way you have it sealed in your forehead so you, you, don't, you don't just think something just because you heard me or someone else say it, but you can prove it in the Bible for yourself. That's how you get the seal of God in your forehead, meaning in your mind. That's how to not be deceived. So let's get into it. Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. In this place you've given us, we can teach your word. And we ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear, to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ, the precious name. Amen. All right, first question we have Stephanie from Indiana. So in that last verse of Acts chapter 2, verse 21, it says... And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Does that mean that even as Christ is returning, those who are unsaved still have an opportunity to be saved before the millennium begins? No, that is not what that means. Like you see in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it, in this dispensation of time, we are saved by, um, by faith. By grace through faith. That's the only way to, to be saved during this period of time. But you see, if someone, if they see Jesus Christ returning, and they say, oh yeah, he's real, now I believe on him, that's not faith. They saw. And if they didn't believe before that, then no, they are not saved, and they do have to go through the millennium, that thousand-year teaching period of Revelation chapter 20. And remember, what's it say in John chapter 3, verse 16? It says, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And to believe, once again, that means through faith. But if you, once again, if you don't believe till you see Him, you didn't have any faith. So, no, they, in that situation, they would have to go through the millennium as students and some might say, well, how do I get faith? Romans chapter 10, verse 17 answers that question for you. It says, for faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Michael, we don't know where Michael's from. Does God already know what we will freely choose to do? God knows everything. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, I'm going to read four verses total in two different places in the scripture that I want to mention. But uh, remember, we're going to start in Isaiah chapter 46. But remember, God is not bound by time. And remember, First John, or Revelation chapter 1 verse 10, John was taken to the Lord's day. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 8 lets you know one day with the Lord is as a thousand years to man. So what's that mean John was taken to the Lord's day? He was taken to the millennium. That's future. That hasn't even happened yet. But you see, God's not bound by time. And he was able to take John there. So John saw everyone that was there. God certainly knows everyone that was there. And then take it even a step further. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the first few verses Paul was even taken to the third heaven. So you know that they knew everyone that was there. So God is not bound by time. God knows all. But I love how you worded it, how you said, um, does God know what we will freely choose? And because God does give free will. But yes, he still knows all things. And I think these uh, scriptures will help to clear up some confusion. We're going to go Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9. And it reads, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and the ancient times, the thing and from the ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Now I just want to read two verses in the book of Romans, chapter nine. In Romans chapters 8 through 11, you learn a great deal about God's elect there. 
We're going to go Romans chapter 9, picking it up, verse 22. And it reads, What if God, willing to show His wrath and to make His power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that He might make known the riches of His glory on the vessels of mercy, which He had afore prepared unto glory? And what does that mean, He prepared them before? God's elect were chosen in the first earth age. Well, why? Because they stood against Satan at his rebellion. But you see, it, it all has to play out because, first of all, we are only saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. None of us deserve salvation. But like you see in John chapter 1 and Colossians chapter 1, Christ has always been, even since the very beginning. So yeah, God knew He was going to create us all with free will, and He knew that we were all going to fall short. He knew we were going to have to have the Savior Jesus Christ. But you see, if God were just to say, oh, I already know everyone who's going to be saved, so I'm just going to stop it right here. No, because see, then Christ would not have died on the cross and resurrected for us, and then so that price wouldn't have been paid. And also, the things that we go through is what causes us to, to love God and to accept Jesus Christ. So it all has to happen. God knows the future, so He's already seen it all. But it all has to happen. Or else, like I said, Christ wouldn't have even died on the cross and we wouldn't have that salvation. But like I said, I love the way you worded it because God does give free will. God knows all, but everyone gets to make that choice. And you only have that up. You only have eternal life through believing in the Savior Jesus Christ. Denise from Indiana. In Luke chapter twenty-one, verse ten; Matthew chapter twenty-four, verse seven through eight; Mark chapter thirteen, verse eight. Jesus said, "Nation will rise against nation." Where else is this quoted from? The fourth witness. This is quoted from Isaiah chapter 19, verse 2. But let's talk a little bit about Matthew 24. What's the subject there? A few disciples ask Christ, what's, it gonna, what's the sign, what's it going to be like at the end of the world? Meaning, what's going to be happening leading up to the second advent of Jesus Christ? Very first warning, Christ said, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you ultimately, it leads up to the deception of Satan as the false Christ, is the, is the subject of Matthew chapter 24. But um, let's read Matthew chapter 24, verses 7 through 8, the verse that you said. And it says, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences, that's disease, and earthquakes in diverse places, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Sorrows in the uh, Greek is Odin. It means the labor pangs. So there we have it from Jesus Christ himself. But you ask where is it quoted from? Isaiah chapter 19, verse 2. Isaiah chapter 19 is talking about the, um, the burden of Egypt. And it's talking about how they, they follow idolatry and they follow wizards and familiar spirits. So yeah, of course God's wrath's going to come down on them. They were doing evil. They did it to themselves. But let's read Isaiah chapter 19, verse 2. It says, And I will set the Egyptians against the Egyptians, and they shall fight everyone against his brother and everyone against his neighbor, city against city and kingdom against kingdom. Now, I'm going to skip down a couple of verses. What does Isaiah chapter 19, verse 4 say? It says, And the Egyptians will I give over into the hand of a cruel Lord, and a fierce king shall rule over them. So that's even prophecy of when Satan arises, the false Christ. Daniel chapter 8, verse 23 says, When the, when the, transgressors, are, when the transgressors are come to the full, a, a king of fierce countenance is going to rise up. And that's to, and, uh, understanding dark sentences. And it goes on to say in verse 25, He by peace shall destroy many. And that's exactly how it's going to be. Satan's going to be disguised as Christ, claiming to be Christ. But yes, yeah, very interesting how that's quoting that Isaiah 19 and how those things are interlocked, those are connected. Then you have another question here. 
Also, Matthew chapter 22, verse 42, Jesus asked them, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? How do you answer this question? And so, first of all, the, how did the Pharisees answer that question? They said, Christ is the son of David. And that is absolutely a fact. Christ would be born through the offspring of David. Jeremiah 23, verse 5, Acts chapter 13, verse 22 and 23, and Revelation 22, verse 16 all prove that. But you see, then Christ would say to him, well, then um, how is it that David said in the, in the spirit, um, my, my Lord, let, let me make sure I say it right here. Uh, Christ says, how then did David in the spirit call him Lord? And then he quoted Psalm chapter 110, verse 1, where it says, the Lord said unto my Lord, meaning the Father said unto the Son, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. And the, the Pharisees, I mean, they, they, didn't want, they didn't know what to say. They couldn't answer that. But so, yes, even though Christ was born of the offspring of David, who's, what is really the, the truth of the matter is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Yes, he was born through the offspring of David, and Christ is called Emmanuel, which means God with us, as you see in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, and uh, Matthew chapter 1, about verse 22 and 23. So one of the main things is you better understand that Jesus Christ is God. And uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 35, where uh, Gabriel would be speaking to Mary, um, says, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost, that the Holy Spirit shall come upon thee. And the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And once again, that's referring to our Savior Jesus Christ. He is the Son of God. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Ben from the United Kingdom. In one of your lectures, you mentioned a small book called The Promises of God, I think. Please, could you remind me of the title? And yes, that title is 101 Bible Promises for Your Every Need. And it's really not even a book. It's just this little box, and it has little cards in it. No commentary from man at all. It's just, the, it's just scriptures written on these little cards. It's, it's definitely awesome. And it, it's the one that I have, at least, is not the King James Version, but that's fine. You can handle it. I mean, match it up to the King James, look, and then you can use your Sean's Concordance from the King James Version. But it, it truly is, uh, it's an awesome little thing. You, you can buy it on the internet for, I saw it today, $5.68 is how much it costs, and plus shipping or whatever. But the point is, it's super cheap. Get 101 promises for your every need right there, just on these little cards. It's awesome. And uh, we, I will mention, we did a whole four-part study, which that's the only study we've ever done ever in four parts. And God's Promises, four-part study, we really go into a bunch of them there. I want to mention just a couple promises that I truly love. First of all, I'm going to mention Isaiah chapter 43, verse 26, where God says, Put me in remembrance and let us plead together so I can justify you. So what God's saying is, remind me of my promises so, so I can make it right, so I can justify you. So, But if you don't study God's word, you don't know his promises, so you sure can't remind God of them. God hasn't forgotten. He wants to know if you've read them. And uh, I'm going to mention, too, that I love 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, God is faithful to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And then another one I've mentioned very often is uh, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7, where it says, When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he even maketh his enemies to be at peace with him. And that is a true fact. And by knowing God's promises, and then you, you see it actually happen. I mean, that's why true faith is you know that God is real. Because he does things for you that no man could ever do. And you see, we don't have the power to change minds. God does. And he can even make your enemies to be at peace with you if your ways are pleasing to him. You remind him of that promise. Francis from South Africa. Please tell me, do you observe the seventh day as Sabbath and the old holy days, food laws, and tithing? Well, what does it say in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17? It says, let no man judge you in respect of meat, 
or drink or in respect of the new moon or the holy days of the sa or the Sabbath days. For those are just a shadow of what is to come, but the body is of Christ. And so we celebrate Jesus Christ every day. We take rest in Jesus Christ every day. And with the food laws, we follow the food laws because that tells you what, how to be healthy. That tells you what's going to make you sick and what's going to keep you healthy. So, yeah, it's a great idea to follow the food laws. I've told this story before. I'll tell it again. There's two different times, and these were several years apart, but that I, I got a meatball sandwich. I thought it was going to be beef, but it had pork in it. Almost instantly, both times, definitely within minutes, one time within just minutes, got sick. Not throwing up, but I didn't feel right, and I was in the bathroom pretty quick, and the other time, I think it was maybe a couple hours later, wasn't feeling right at all. So you see, God, God created these flesh bodies. He knows what's going to make you sick and what's going to be good for you. So very wise idea if you want to avoid cancer, if you want to avoid all types of diseases. God's health law is a very wise thing to follow. And you said about tithing, and tithing is what helps the church to continue to bring forth the word. And what does it say in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10? It says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So God's saying, if you tithe to a church that is teaching the meat, that's teaching the truth, you're going to be so blessed, you're just going to overflow with blessings. But we, of course, have never asked for tithes. We never ask for money. God doesn't send beggars. But yes, we do have people that tithe because they, they want the truth to keep coming. And they know Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. But do not ever let someone make merchandise of you. Don't ever let someone guilt trip you into paying tithes. Don't ever let someone, uh, don't, don't let them guilt trip you into it. Don't let, uh, Christ would say in uh, John chapter 2, verse 16, make not my father's house of merchandise. And 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 speaks about false prophets that bring in damnable heresies. And it says, through covetousness, they make merchandise of you. Many times, that's all they want your money. If they talk about tithes over and over, guess what? They want your money. That's what they're after. So do not be made merchandise of. I'll also mention uh, the second epistle of John, chapter 1, verse 10, 11. Because remember what it said in Malachi, chapter 10? It said, so the meat can be brought forth. Hebrews, chapter 5, the last few verses, it's letting you know, don't get stuck on milk. How many have been in church so long, they should have been teachers by now, but they never get to the deeper truths. They just, get, keep caught, they just keep getting taught the basics over and over and over, and they're stuck on milk. But Malachi chapter 3 said, bring in the tithe so the meat can be brought forth. The deeper truths of God's word, the entire word of God from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. And then, like I said, the second epistle of John chapter 1 verse 10, 11 it says, if anyone comes bringing you a different doctrine, meaning some other doctrine besides the gospel of Jesus Christ, it says, don't let them in your house and don't even bid them God's speed. Don't say, oh yeah, God bless you, man. You brought forth a great message. Don't say that if they're teaching against the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it says, if you do, you are a partaker of their evil deeds. So if you're not even supposed to bid them God's speed, you certainly don't want to pay tithes to them. So don't be made merchandise of. You always do what you feel led by God to do. Michael, and this is the same Michael from before. We don't know where Michael's from. No one knows the literal day and hour. And you mentioned the Greek words, hemera and aura. No one knows the literal day and hour of the Lord's return. Um, if it's true that the wise can know the times and seasons, then why does Acts chapter 1 verse 7 say it is not for you to know the times or the seasons, which the Father has, hath put in his own power? And what uh, Michael was originally quoting is that Matthew chapter 24 again, verse 36. But we don't know the year. Well, we don't know the decade. 
but we know the chronological order of events. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, among many other places, make it abundantly clear. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, make it so clear no one could ever deny it if, if they've studied God's word at all with understanding. What does it say? Paul says, I, I beseech you, brethren, meaning please listen to me about the gathering to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It says, that, it says, let no man deceive you by, by even letter as from us. Don't let anyone twist God's word on you or by some spirit or anything like that. Because our gathering together to Jesus Christ shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, that Satan, of course, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God and that is worshipped, who sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And that is when Satan will arrive on earth as the false Christ. Not going to be gathered together unto Jesus Christ until after the deception of Satan as the false Christ. And you also read in Mark 13 and Matthew 24, it gives you all the, um, the different details about the deception of the false Christ. And then it says, after that tribulation, you shall see the power of the Son of Man coming in the clouds. So don't ever let someone deceive you. You know from Mark 13, your job is to stand against the false Christ and to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. And you know from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50 through 52, that when Jesus Christ returns at the seventh trumpet, everyone's changed into a spiritual body. So if you know that we're still in a flesh, if you're still in a flesh body, Jesus Christ has not returned. So we got to know all those details. Once again, we don't know the year or the decade, but we do know the order of events. The false Christ arrives first. Don't be deceived. One more question. David and Barbara from Mississippi. But wouldn't we think anyone who truly is a Christian would know this? And she's speaking, they're speaking about the coming of the false Christ. And not believe he is Christ if they are truly Christians? Well, how many Christians do you know that, that know about the deception of Satan as the false Christ and know that they're supposed to stand against him and allow the Holy Spirit to speak through them? Not, certainly not the majority and uh, you say, truly Christian, I, I hope that you're not trying to judge people because anyone that truly loves Jesus Christ and believes that he is the son of God and that he died on the cross and resurrected for us, they are truly Christian and don't go try to judge anyone. There are many people that are Christian that they've just never been taught the truth and they're absolutely going to be deceived and they're going to worship the false Christ. And that's one of the most tragic things of all time. But I mean, they were never taught the truth. They didn't study to show themselves approved. And they're going to be deceived. But I mean, what about Matthew chapter 25, the ten virgins? Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Five of them had enough oil in their lamp. The other five didn't. I mean, the other five, they didn't do their due diligence in studying. Then they wanted to wait till the very last minute. All oh, the bridegrooms come and they said, hey, give us some of your oil. They know that that's not how it works. So you see, they waited until it was too late. They went out trying to get some oil. Then the bridegroom came and the door was shut. Then they came back and said, Lord, open up to us. And he, what did he say? I think he said, I, I don't know you. And you might, and you might, and the door was shut on them. They didn't get a partake in the, the wedding of Jesus Christ at the second advent. You might also want to make note of Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. So, no, many who are truly Christian, they're going to be deceived because they were never taught the truth. But don't worry. Worst case scenario, that there are definitely many who, even though they were deceived, they're going to hear the Holy, they're going to hear the Holy Spirit speak through God's elect. And then they're going to come out of the deception. But then worst case scenario, there is still that millennium, that thousand year teaching period of Revelation 20 that will begin when the true Christ returns. And don't ever forget Mark chapter 13, verse 20, which says, except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. That means if God didn't shorten the time, every single person in a flesh body would be deceived by the false Christ. 
That's how incredible the deception is going to be. So don't you underestimate that. And then it says, but for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. And then it goes on to say, and if they say to you, lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. For false Christs and false prophets shall rise, showing signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. So you see, I can kind of tell by the way you word the question, it seems like you're underestimating that deception. You're like, oh, if someone's Christian, they're not going to be deceived. No, many, many Christians are going to be deceived because they never truly studied the whole word of God. They didn't search it out. They didn't study to show themselves approved like it says to in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. So make sure you do everything you possibly can to diligently study and to get prepared to stand against the false Christ. And you know, it's not something to worry about. It's not something to be afraid of. Just make sure you study. I mean, we're going to be have the two witnesses prophesying to us God, during that tribulation, I mean. God's going to let you know exactly what he wants you to do. Just make sure you study and you prepare for that time. And you stand against Satan when he's here as a false Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. That way, many people can come out of the deception. It's a very important job you have as one of God's elect. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and for giving us the understanding of your word and the prophecies of what's coming even in the future to us. And we don't know how soon or far away that may be, but we know we need to be prepared to make that stand. And we just thank you for all your blessings, and we ask you to continue to give us understanding, not just for ourselves, but so we can share it with others. Thank you, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ's precious name, amen. This was recorded in the year 2023 at Smyrna Christian Church in Kokomo, Indiana by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.